what I want to do today is to share with all of you folks um, some thoughts about foreshortening flowers and and arranging those those petals on your page. Also, to think about the spacing between petals. There's a beautiful symmetry that comes out in flowers, and we want to be able to show that symmetry in our drawings and sketches. So how do we do that? <clears throat> well, I'm glad you asked. Let's take a look. All right, here we go. I am going to share with you folks a, um, a screen. Where is it? There it is, the keynote presentation for shortening flowers. Also, Melinda's here too. Oh, great. Um, are, are you able to make her a co-host? Or Sorry. Let's, let's see if we can do that. Melinda, thank you so much for helping us out today. Um, so we're going to start with aligning flowers, aligning the, the petals on flowers. And then we're going to start foreshortening those aligned flowers. And it's going to be pretty cool. So I, what I want to do is to just sort of start off with these kind of uh, like everybody to draw four of these crosshair circles. And so you're going to draw a circle and this then just put the plus mark through it. Try to make these as symmetrical as you can. Um, if you've got a little lid um, for a, a, a pot so on your piece of paper, Mia, you might want to use this. So you've got some little pot or can you can trace around the outside edge of it. It's going to give you a nice circle. So you want four circles. And then you're going to put those little, here you go, um, put the crosshairs through them. And um, this is going to be a template, a sort of geometry template for thinking about the symmetry of petals with three petals, four petals, five petals, and six petals. Give you a moment to do that now. So Carolina, welcome. Um, so what we're doing is on in your journal, you're going to draw four circles. Yeah. And you can use this as your trace. Um, well, you both can, but you don't have your journal out yet. Um, so I am guessing by now, some of you have those four circles on your page. And um, if not, don't worry, you'll have a chance to kind of drop in some of those other circles in a moment. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just start looking at sort of the, I want to around, uh, what I'm imagining this circle is, is the outside edge of one of these, uh, of a flower. And if it is a, and the, the petal tips go all the way to the outside edge. So if it is a four petal flower, how to get that drawing symmetrical is really easy. Um, all you're going to do is draw crosshairs right through the middle of it. And where those crosshairs meet the edge of the circle, that is where um, you're going to put your little dot down. And what this dot is going to do is to allow you to, um, to draw your petals in symmetrically. So if you have a, I'm going to escape for a moment, stop this share. I'm going to bring you over to the, no, nope, not that. I'm going to bring you over to here. There we are. So what 
the way this is going to work is, and once you draw those circles, then just, oh, good, you passed it to me. So you want to get your circle on there. Um, let's say this is my circle. And I've got a dot here, 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 and here. If I'm drawing something, let's say a brassica, a mustard, and it's got four petals, and they all come out of the middle here, and those are narrow petals, I'm going to be drawing in those petals roughly like this. All right, and this is going to allow me to get my four symmetrical petals. So if there are narrow petals, this is how I'm going to do it. If I'm drawing something like a poppy, and there are four petals, but they're broad, what I think of is a line going from the center, and that line is then going to come up to, um, that line is going to come up to the edge of this little spot here. The next one is gonna come up like this. And I'm going to tuck this petal in behind this one. Um, you want to look on your flower. Do you have two petals? Are there any petals that are on top? Are there others that are tucking behind? Um, so, but but here at these these sort of points between these, that's where your your petal is your your petal edges are. So this allows me to kind of get symmetrical petals. So you could your these these dots then are either dot 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 the tips of skinny petals. or where the edge of a broad petal comes out. And if there's somewhere in between, you get to decide. All right. So the, the symmetry for the four petaled one is really easy. It's just those crosshairs through the center of the flower. And, um, but when you get into other symmetries, there are some the surprising and interesting things that start to happen. So here we have our four petals. Let's now take a look at how to handle three petals. What I want everybody to do is on your three petal circle, you're going to add in two more lines, one line right along the bottom of the circle. And so one line right along the bottom of your circle and one line right between those two. So essentially what you've done is you've divided the bottom half of this circle into fourths. So that that one line there in the in the, the middle of it, I'm going to where my little pointer is pointing. That one is halfway between the bottom and the halfway point of this circle. So if I get those points in, that's where I put my dots. For <coughs> my three petaled flower. And then um, If I am Let's coming from the center here. Let's say I've got three big petals here. I'm going to make these ones pointy. I can put those out and that makes this nice sort of symmetrical peace sign. Um, if there are little sepals sticking out like in a trillium, you'll see those sticking out in those spaces between them. But we've got now symmetrically spaced three petals. But wait, there's more. Because if you can do three, then doing six is really easy. Here's your three. What do we do for six 
Well, take a look back here at what we had with the sepals. Notice that those sepals are pointing out just between the three. So on, if I'm drawing in three more petals, let's say if there's a six, uh, say a lily family thing, if I was drawing in, you're just gonna go halfway between those other petals. So if I have a circle with one, two, three spots on it, all I have to do is put is bisect, cut each of those in half. And now I have my circle evenly divided into six petals. And you'll notice also that on a six petaled one, there's always one petal directly on the opposite side from the other petal. So they're in these pairs. They've got one is one, one side, the other's on the other side, top, bottom, and then there's two on the right, two on the left. So draw in that symmetry. That's um, kind of an interesting thing with, with six petaled flowers. Um, when you kind of get into them, uh, very often the shapes of them are very similar. Botanists will often call these tepals because you can't quite tell, is it a sepal or a petal? And so we call them tepals. So if I've got my little tepals there, let's say I'm drawing blue-eyed grass, I would draw those in. And it's interesting, when you look, when you're drawing a six-petaled flower, you will often find... They can't see it so well. They can't see that so well? Put that picture on the big screen. Okay, I can do that. I've got uh, my my technical support team suggests that we uh, just take a look at this little inset with uh, or the 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 screen here on the big big screen. Um, what we're kind of pointing out is that when I'm drawing a six petal flower, um, even if it's blue eyed grass, where they're very similar to each other, if you take a look at the tips of these three ones that will make one set of three, you'll find that the tips are slightly different shaped, slightly differently shaped than the other three. And there will be three that will be a little bit more on the top and three that will be a little bit more on the bottom. So that's a really fun thing to look for. Those look like bananas on yours? No, there's um, oh, um, the lines grow on. Oh, this, this here looks like a banana. This is like a cluster of six bananas? Yeah. <laughs> I like that. So there's your six symmetry. So if you can do three, you can do six. But wait, there's more. Let's jump back to the dots. Yeah, we're going to go back to the circle dots thing. The circle dots thing. <laughs> um, and put it on the big screen. Put that on the big screen. That's absolutely right, Carolyn. Um, Carolyn, thank you so much for pointing out that I should show people that big screen. That was helpful. Um, here we are. So for the three, the four, and the six, it's been very clean, perfect numbers. So that is to say that this is the sort of thing that the Pythagoreans thought was absolutely beautiful. Like you just cut this in half and now you describe, you know, an equilateral triangle off of the circle. And, you know, it's, it's, it's exact. Um, we get, um, but for the five, this is where kind of imperfect numbers um, kind of come in. And this is something that would have driven the Pythagoreans nutso because they would want to say like, so where do I put my lines to get my five petaled one? And on this one, it is going to be a little bit messy. It's gonna be a little bit messy. So here's the, it's, it's not gonna be this crisp, clean geometry. What we're going to do is we're going to draw in two more lines on this circle. I think, and, I'm not totally sure that we're seeing the same thing that Oh, um, are you seeing three petals, four petals, five petals, six petals? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. 
So that's what we want. So what we're going to do is I'm going to add two more lines to this five petal one. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Actually, first I was going to say for your six, um, what you do is you just put your dots halfway through that one, right? Yeah. Hey, Carolyn, have a really good class. Thank you for joining for this. And thank you so much for helping us um, me know when to kind of go to the big screen. I hope you have a really good class. I love you. And now for five. And this is, it's going to get a little bit messy. I'm going to draw in two more lines. Where exactly do these lines go? Well, the first line, this one on the bottom, goes a little bit above the bottom. So not at the half, it's not at this, where this sort of quarter point was. It's a little bit below that. And you notice that I'm not being specific here. I'm giving you this, all this kind of wishy-washy language. So it's a little bit below that. And the other one is a little bit above the center line. Notice that neither of these are a full quarter. And um, the one above, it's a little bit higher above that line than the bottom one is off the, the bottom. So the little the bottom one comes up a little bit off the bottom, and the top one comes up a little bit more than that. And again, I apologize, this is wishy-washy language, right? Um, it's not like a crisp third or a quarter or anything like that. It's we're going to come a little bit off the bottom, and then a little bit more of that off the midline. Um, somebody had, had asked a pretty good question, a way of visualizing it. Um, she asks, if you treat the circle as a clock, would you say that the bottom line goes from five across to seven? Oh, um, so in the, so this would be, uh, 12, 6, 3, 9, um, three, and then I will have to, um, I'll, I'll actually have to put my 12 points in and find out, figure out where these guys um, put in. It looks like roughly that. Um, these, these, yeah, that would be fun to do. I, I should look at this five relative to a clock. Um, right now, I don't have the mental bandwidth to figure it out. But it looks like roughly that will get you in kind of close to the right place. Thank you. Um, so For these, that's going to give you your last five points. And because we've got these sort of irrational numbers here, um, that's why I'm not able to be exact and say this is exactly at this point, exactly at this point. So the advantage of this is that um, um, the advantage of this is that I can then, I can draw a circle and it, I can roughly go, you know, here, roughly like this, roughly like this, kind of down here oh, and okay. kind of down here. Could you maybe um, make it so that what you're drawing is bigger too again? Sure, like let's do that again. Go, go for the Carolyn suggestion. Yes, thank you. Um, I am, oh, I wonder, oh, let's try this. Did it just jump back to that? Did, did, has it gone to the big screen? Um, it, we still are seeing three, four, five, and six pedals on the big screen. All right, so I have to go like that. All right, so let me just sort of draw this in again. So if, if I draw a circle, what I'm doing is I can go like, I've got a spot at the top. And then the other one is gonna be roughly somewhere up here. And the others are gonna be kind of roughly down here. And then what I can do when they're just little dots around the circle is I can kind of go like, ha, did I kind of get that those roughly in the right place? 
because um, at this point, it's easy for me to kind of, oh, I'm going to move this one down here. Now I want to move it up there. You can kind of move these dots around a little bit. Like these two are a little bit, I want each of these spaces to be the same. I'm going to move this one up a little bit. Yeah, it wants to be there more. There, there, and there. And then um, it does not have to be exact because flowers even though there may be some sort of plan back there that's very symmetrical you know one flower may come up just uh, one petal may come up just a little bit kind of crooked and the minute you're kind of adding in you know just a little bit of floppy petalness you just want something that is roughly going to get you in the neighborhood All right and you've got your symmetrical petals this approach with the dots around the circle avoids this problem. Here's the problem we're avoiding. If you ever drawn a flower like this, a five petaled flower where you drew in your first petal and then you drew in the second petal and then the third petal and somewhere around here, you're realizing, oh, this, you know, it just the, the geometry, the symmetry of it just gets all funky. When we're doing it this way with those dots, that's going to solve that problem. So that's the sort of under, under layer of geometry um, in the flower. Now, <laughs> um, things are going to get really interesting. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take these circles and we're going to mess with them just a little bit. Um, we're going to take this geometry, which I th think is initially kind of straightforward to kind of kind of uh, get under your belt. We're going to see like what is what's the next level of um, you know, working your drawing. Let me get that screen share up again. Um, Avea, are you seeing three, four, five, six? on the screen there? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Well, now, here's what I'm doing. Um, right here, I've got my five petal one. And if you take a close look, what I've done is um, uh, this one right, uh, the second one over, uh, I've got a petal pointing straight up. To the left and the right of it, I've rocked those to the left and the right just a little bit. And the one on the far right, I've spun it uh, just a little bit more so that the pedal is over here, so that actually one is straight up and one is straight down. And what I want us to first notice is that the when we're kind of putting dots around a circle, your the tip of one of your petals does not have to be pointing up on your page right it could be pointing any direction and then you'd make the symmetry off of that so you can have um so if you take your um your circle and you just put your dots at different places around it um you're going to be able to draw that flower then at a different angle. So all you're doing is spinning where that center line on the flower is. I think we had a little trouble seeing your, okay, there we go. All right. So rather than making it straight up, I just tilt it over to the side a little bit. Um, and that is going to um, uh, <clears throat> spoiler alert. Um, so step one is your pedal doesn't have to point straight up. But now, let me stop sharing. What I want to do is start to foreshorten these flowers. So I'm going to jump back to the jack cam. Oh, actually, we can do this right here. 
if you have a flower, um, you can do this looking at the flower that's in your hand. Um, if you don't, you can take a look here on the screen. But notice that the flower here is the outside tips of those petals inscribes a circle. I'm going to turn this over so you're not distracted by the petals. We've got a circle. If I tilt this flower, look at what happens to the outside shape of the flower. What was a circle is now an oval. So you see the same thing here with this. If I tilt this on the side, this circular surface is now an oval. So if I'm looking at something like this, I tilt it, and that circular surface is an oval. And the more I tilt it, the more narrow that oval becomes. If there are petals that are inscribed on the top of that, those petal tips still go to the tips, the edges of the circle, but that circle is now an oval. And what has happened is that the apparent size of each of those petals has changed. Notice that on the side here where this petal is, that petal still looks long. But look at the distortion in this petal here. It looks really short, but it looks wide. So I've got a wide short one here. I have a narrow long one right here. So as I tilt the flower, the dimensions of the oval changes. That is, it keeps the same width, but the distance top to bottom, the height gets smaller. The same thing happens with every petal on there. Let's look at this in a diagram form. What we're looking at here <clears throat> what we're looking at here is all I've done is taken this oval and squished it. I take the oval and I squish it. So notice that, that this one is still pointing up, still pointing up, still pointing up, still pointing up. This one pointing down, pointing down, pointing down, pointing down. This one to whatever o'clock it is over here, that is pointing in the same direction. So if I were to, whoop, all right, um, sorry. Notice, let's just take a look at this row here. And we're going to take a look at the top petal. Watch it get shorter. Now, Let's take a look at the one on the far left. See that one that is pointing off to the left? Watch it get skinnier. So as it gets skinnier, it actually keeps exactly the same length. It just gets skinnier. This one in the middle that's pointing straight up, as I go down the screen, it keeps the same width, but it gets shorter. And something that is in between those two positions, like this pedal right here, notice that it gets a little bit skinnier and a little bit shorter. So the ones that are in between, here's a good example of that. Let's take a look at this one right here, this pedal here. As I go down, it gets a little bit skinnier, right? Notice that compare the width of this one and the width of this one. So the one down below is clearly skinnier. And also look at the length of the one on top and the length of the one here. It's in between both of those. Right, it's, it's, so, so, so it's, it's gotten skinnier and it's gotten shorter. Let's look at this another way. So here are the four circles that we had before. 
And what I'm going to do is there's our dot. So that's where we started off is I'm going to take each of these and rotate them slightly. And what I've done is I've mathematically figured out the kind of ideal amount of rotation that gets these pedals into a really kind of different position. Um, for instance, with uh, just kind of uh, uh, show you kind of what I'm thinking here. Notice that if I take this five pedal one and I rotate it 90 degrees um, here, um, uh, th then I am, or, or, or sorry, uh, you know, if, if I go to this and I rotate it 180 degrees, then you're obviously just in the same mirror image position. Um, what are the, how far do I rotate it to the side um, to kind of get it so that the pedals are in kind of a, a different and, and interesting position. So that's, that's what's going on here. I've got these and I've rotated them each just a little bit. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to squish each of these shapes, right? So we're going to do the same thing where we take that circle and I turn it into an oval, turn it into an oval, turn it into an oval, right? Into more of a squishy oval. Let's see what happens to Notice on the top row that the distances between the dots is all the same. Take a look at, say, the five one on the bottom or the six one on the bottom. Look at the distances between those dots. Do you see what's happened? As the circle gets squished on the sides, the distance between those dots also gets squished, but only on the sides. Just like a pedal that is going straight up doesn't change its width. The distance between where the tips of two of these pedals would come out changes as we squish that oval. And so notice that these, these dots, they're, they're, all I've done is taken the circle and squished them, right? And as I project that down, because it's on this circle, the distances between the pedal tips on that line change. It's totally counterintuitive. It's weird and it's cool. Now, I'm going to put in just rectangles to represent the, um, say, uh, narrow pedals in there. And look at those as they go down. Like, let's look at the four one the, the, with the four. Notice that the pedals on the sides get skinnier. The pedals on the top and the bottom keep their exact width all the way through, right? And ones that are somewhere in between those are somewhere in between those. When you have pedals that are pointing off towards the side, like take a look at the row of rotated five, take a look at um, how the ones on the sides there, you can have pedals really close to each other. But if you were making that up, think how easily your brain would want to symmetrically space those out so that they remain the same distance apart. See, this is why this visualization is so powerful. Your brain knows that those pedals are symmetrically spaced. So when you're drawing it foreshortened, your brain wants to keep them symmetrically spaced. But that's not what you're going to be seeing. So knowing that, 
you're going to be able to look at the flower and go like, oh, they're over on the side there. Look at how close those tips are. Ah, thought you could trick me. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Um, here's a few bonus positions. Um, these ones I find um, are just a, a little bit more uh, symmetrical and so not quite as um, it, it, exciting, but still kind of useful and kind of fleshes out our, our, our possibilities of, of what we could see. But this little visualization here is incredibly powerful. So what I'm um, going to be posting on my site is a printout sheet that just has this diagram on it. And I'm trying to, to figure out you know, what, what, is the, what is the way to make all of this information the most clear. But I'm going to be printing out and I'm posting today something that has this diagram with the spacing in these different positions as the as the thing as the one as the uh, flowers are oriented symmetrically and then rotated off to the side. So it becomes an asymmetrical petal pattern as you go down. Okay. Um, <clears throat> This um, this little insight is very very powerful for the 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 drawings that we do. Um, I'm going to just jump back to. Share, All right. Um, I just I'm going to jump back to where is there it is. So if I have my pattern and I'm going to make I'm going to draw um, a foreshortened flower, what I now am going to be able to do is. Um, just say to myself, all right, um, here's a five petaled, here's a five petaled flower. And the shorter these are, the more broad I'm going to make them. This one is going to be nice and broad. And this one over here is going to be skinny. When you're looking at a real flower, you'll be able to, um, you know, one, one thing you'll be you'll be able to do, which is easier than making it up in your head, you'll be able to look at your real flower and kind of that's your circle, you know, you know, there's my petal tip, there's my petal tip, there's my petal tip, there's my petal tip, right? So you're just copying whatever you see on the real flower real time, so you don't have to make it up, but knowing that oh, if you're over on the sides, you're going to be closer together. If you're not, there's going to be a larger space. Allows you to get these negative shapes. Look at these negative shapes here. Your brain wants those to be symmetrical. Oh, could you please um, bring your paper? Oh. There we go. So your brain wants this negative shape to be symmetrical with this negative shape. And this little study helps you um, not be able to do that or, or be able to do that. There's one other piece to this um, that may be getting, the, the, this next thing that I'm going to show you is a really 
advanced step with this. It's the same idea, but we're going to take a look at what happens with this kind of foreshortening just at the tip of an individual petal or an individual leaf. Because there's a very counterintuitive thing that happens. And so um, this next step that I'm about to show you, um, if your brain is already feeling really full right now, you totally have my permission just to kind of kick your feet back and, um, and just kind of you know watch with curiosity, but don't stress out about getting this next little point because I didn't notice this for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. And, years. and um, I've talked to a bunch of botanical artists and I show it to them, they go, oh my gosh, like I should have seen that, but I guess I didn't. And you look at their drawings, their drawings just look like great drawings, but, but this little, this next little subtle thing, there's some very funny things that happen to petal tips when they are, not when they're straight out to the side, not when they're straight up and down, but how they get distorted when they are at kind of a 45 degree angle. And we're gonna learn that now. And this is also going to be true if you're drawing a leaf that is pointing towards you and it gets foreshortened, All right? It's gonna behave in a predictable way. This side is gonna be symmetrical with that side. Um, if it gets, if there's a leaf that is pointing this way and it gets rocked away from you, it's going to behave in a very predictable way. This top side equal to the bottom side. They'll keep their symmetry, but buckle your seat belts, folks, because this is the extra bonus feature. I need to go to the screen share. There it is. All right. What I've got here is a diagram of a leaf, right? a diagram of a leaf, and I've got all those different positions. One is pointing straight to the side, one is pointing straight down, and what I've got is then just slowly getting it more pointing down. What I'm going to do is take this series of drawings and progressively squish it top to bottom as if it is um, the leaves are being foreshortened um, uh, towards you. So that this petal, he this one here, you know how it's going to behave. This one here, as it rotates towards you, you're going to see it keep the same width but the length of its top to bottom will get shorter and shorter. This one here will keep the same length, but the distance top to bottom will get shorter. But what about these things here? Let's check it out. Are you seeing that? This one down here on the bottom behaved just like we expected it to. This one on the top when I got narrower. But look at this petal, this leaf right there. And you see a little bit of a, a little bit more of a, a little bit of kind of a ghost of it here, ghost of it here. It's subtler up here, but when you get to here, it's really dramatic. Look at the dark green side and the light green side. What is happening? You are looking at this edge from different angles. Here that edge is pointing towards you and is foreshortened. Here that edge is running along your field of view, just like this was. 
and it's changing the shape of the tip of these. So a petal that is pointing straight towards you or a leaf pointing straight towards you, you will see the symmetry on it. But for years, I've been drawing these ones that are coming out at 45 degree angles as symmetrical. It's close. But then you look at, especially when you get to the tip of it, oh, that's different, right? So if I have, let's stop the share. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to cut out a little leaf shape here. And if your piece of paper uh, if you printed out one of those things, like here's a little leaf shape, and I'm going to get this roughly symmetrical. All right. Not bad. And I'm going to draw a center line through this. I am going to zoom out. All right, here we go. I take this and I tilt it up towards you. Whoops, I need to get it pointing right towards me. All right, so when I tilt it this, ah, this is, I'm not running into that thing where if I move it to the right, it moves the opposite direction on my screen. It's hard for my brain to wrap around that. But if, notice how when it is pointing towards you, you, it looks symmetrical, but now look at the difference between this side and this side. You see how the far side is, is coming out straight and at the end, it tucks in really fast right in here. This close side is a longer straight curve, but this one stays broad and at the end it jumps in, this one curves around. That is the distortion in the leaf or the petal tip that you will see at, if, it, if it's flat, you don't see that. If on the other hand, it is, the, the, the leaf is pointing towards you and it's off at a 45 degree angle from you, this distortion appears. Now this is, um, is super anal retentive and picky, right? Um, <clears throat> and you're thinking, I just want to draw some flowers, and I don't want to be like stressing out about, you know, the the some detail of this this little petal petal tip. Um, whoops. Um, and if you know, these things like I'm taking points and I'm kind of doing the math. If this is feeling like a super rigid kind of geometric system that is missing the life and vibrancy of the flowers, you're right. You're absolutely right. And I totally agree with you. But what we're going to do is we're going to understand some of these subtles of non-intuitive geometry, the, the subtleties of this non-intuitive geometry, so that when we're looking at the flower, we'll be able to get things roughly into those right, uh, correct positions. Things like, you know, the petal tips, they're not going to be symmetrical. Um, that's this, it's this really weird counterintuitive idea. When you're drawing the flower, your, your hand is going to want to make them symmetrical. But knowing this, you can just look back at the flower and say, what are you doing? The, the, the answer is always just copy whatever the flower is doing. But knowing that those tips are going to be, have that asymmetry to them, right? At those 45 foreshortened positions, you've got a fighting chance of actually seeing it. 
But if you don't know that that's going to happen, what you're going to do is exactly the same thing that I did for years and years and years and years and years, is I drew them all symmetrical when they're coming out into the 45. There's something that felt a little bit wrong and I couldn't ever figure out what it was. In future classes in this botanical illustration series, what we're going to do is we are going to learn just how to put all sorts of life and curl and nuance and subtleties and bug bites into our petals. We're going to turn our petals and our leaves back into these organic forms. But in the back of our head, there will also be this sort of geometric framework so that your brain is gonna be doing two things. It's gonna be able to look at the flower, look at the petal and say like, oh, I see your geometry. That's cool. And I can geek out about that, right? And I'll be able to get that down. Like, look, those two, like the negative shape between those two petals on that side is really, really skinny. And on that side, it's really, really big. Isn't that interesting? You'll be able to pick those sort of things out. And we're going to, in sculpting the individual petals, they're going to have life and nuance and all the little crazy things that they like to do. But that nuance and sort of liveliness is going to be on top of a template that also understands the structure and the very non-intuitive things that foreshortening does, especially at these 45 degree angles. So future classes, we're going to be twisting petals, we're going to be curling them, we're going to be doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Right? This class, we're just going deep into geometry land. So it might feel like, because we're stopping here at the end of our hour, that that is the end of the line. No, no, no. This is, this is one layer of what's happening in your brain. And then we'll put the nuance layer on top of that, and you'll have nuanced lifelike petals that are in the right places. But if you don't start with this, you'll get a petal that looks all nuancey and great. But it's not going to fit into the geometry of the rest of the flower. So an individual petal will be like, hey, I'm feeling great but it's not going to make sense in the context of putting it into this form of the flower. So my challenge for you this week is to go to a florist or out into the field, find some flowers, and geek out on their geometry. Start just looking at them straight down, this view. Then tilt it, rotate it, play with those things. And if you're feeling really bold, look at sort of, I'm going to say like, I'm going to like challenge myself to at least a couple of the petals are going to be coming out at the 45 degree angle in a foreshortened position. And I want to on the real thing, be able to see what's happening there. Subsequent classes, we'll get into the nuance, but let's just play with this geometry a little bit. So think of these as kind of diagrams. You don't even have to think of them as a drawing, right? You're not trying to even make a representation of this plant. You kind of make a diagram and you want to see, can you see that geometry? If that happens in your brain, you'll then be able to put this other stuff on top of it and you'll be like, ah, oh, I get it, I get it, I get it. I got the life, I got the structure, I got life and structure. You can have them both. You can have them both. And I think you're going to really like the uh, wildflowers that are going to then start blooming off of your page. I hope that this was a useful workshop for you, that you had some fun here. And, uh, and thank you so much for being with us. These, these classes are supported by donations from viewers like you. If it's possible to make a donation on my website, you go to johnmirlaws.com and you can find um, the backlog of all the previous classes. I actually didn't put the last botanical illustration one up because I wanted to redo it. So if you notice, there's a little bit of the same content in this one as the last one, but this one was done better, right? Okay, so um, I'm gonna put this one up instead of the other one. And, um, but if you're, if you're able to make a donation to support me doing this, I greatly appreciate that. If that doesn't work with your finances right now, um, then, um, then please don't worry about making a donation, but I want to encourage you to, to do an act of kindness, stewardship, or service in your community.
in a way that's COVID safe and see if we can just sort of bring up our general level of awesomeness and um, see if there's just something that you can do to make your world or community uh, a better place. If you did that um, as, a, as a thank you to me for these workshops, I feel really, th that fills my heart with joy and it's really, really important. Um, so deliberate acts of kindness, service and, and stewardship in the community. And then we, uh, we're all living in a better place. Um, also, if you are um, during this time in a financial hardship and you need journaling supplies, send me a, um, a private message and let me know what you need. Um, if there's something that is on my store that you need and it's going to really kind of up your game and you can't afford it, let me know and we'll figure out what we can do to get you what you need. Um, also, some people will send me like boxes of art supplies. And let's say like, I found this in my attic, it belonged to my, you know, uh, my, my, uh, my, my aunt and she never used it. And, you know, here's all these watercolors or brushes. And so I've got, I've got a number of different sorts of supplies. Um, and I can like make a little kind of surprise care package out for you. Like, but let me know what you need and I will do what I can to get um, materials into your hands that will allow you to, um, to do this. Um, so the nature journaling is generally not a very expensive hobby, but there are some tools in here that will up your game if getting access to those things is, is a barrier. Um, let me know, and I want you to know that I am here for you, and I'm here to help you. And um, the, so John Muir Laws dot, um, John Muir, John Muir Laws at johnmuirlaws.com. I think that's it, um, is the official business one. Um, if you want to get on my personal um, uh, email, that's at gmail.com, johnmuirlaws at gmail.com. Um, and so shoot me a, a message, and um, I'm here to help you out. And thank you, so, folks, so much for being here. Let's jump over now to our community cam. And um, would love to see uh, what has been happening in people's nature journals. And um, I'm going to remove my spotlight. Um, if you don't want to be seen, just turn off your camera at this point. And um, let me see here. I'm going to the gallery. And all you have to do is take your journal and hold it up to the screen. And then I see you on the screen holding your book. I, I see Nicholas. I see um, uh, Ray Bonto. So I'm going to start with Nicholas, Ray Bonto, and then Annette. So uh, then LK. So it'll be Nicholas, Ray Bonto, Annette, LK, and then we'll see who is up. Um, we're going to make it possible for you to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, you can unmute yourself. Um, Nicholas, um, you. Hello, are... everyone. Hi there. Uh, Thank you for uh, for all your help uh, today. It was amazing. Like uh, it's so difficult, in fact, to to draw these flowers, and I never imagined that. In very nice tips, but I, well, the, the I thing that will make it easier is when there's the real flower in front of you. You're basically just copying that flower, but you're then trying to. But this these visualizations will help you be able to do that. So abstracted without the flower, you're going like, oh man, what am I doing here? You'll find that these. This framework, when you have the real flower in front of you, is going to make it a lot easier. Nice, yeah. That's uh, it's we are we're going to wait a bit for the spring here for more flowers, but we will also use your trick of uh, getting flowers from a, a place nearby and and get this uh, house flowers for for exercising yourself. But uh, okay. I, I wanted to actually jump on a drawing I made some some time ago. Uh, here it is uh, on a polar bear. Uh, I had the chance as a biologist to do polar bear surveys in the past, uh, oh. a couple of years. Uh, so you, you were out in the field with the polar bears? Yes, uh, but we had the chance to, to do this uh, by helicopter with the government of Nunavut in Northern Canada. And um, so I went back to them and, and I wanted to maybe make a link to the, the lesson from early this week with the snow and, and the ice. And, and uh, I, won, I was wondering whether, even though I did that on a white paper, whether I could 
build up some colors for it because it's just a quick drawing from where we were seeing that we were getting close to them to make to be able to sex them and age them uh, for the the, the complete sur survey of uh, that population uh, some years ago that um that's a uh, that's really cool um yes yes um so uh, just a couple of thoughts on that. There's something that is really wonderful about, you know, so the white bear on the white page, um, you've got these, uh, what are called lost and found edges going on. Um, so we look at like the, the nose line of that profile bear, maybe we put that up again. Um, it's, it's disappearing into the page, but you know where it is. Um, sometimes we overtell with our, our journals, I think that that with our drawings, I think that the, the, those those sketches there do a really good job of, you know, not having to lock everything in. There are some parts that just like a polar bear disappears into its environment, and I would want to kind of keep that that feeling um, that feeling to it. Um, but yes, you for for putting in color with something like this. Um, you, you can, although what you might consider doing is, is doing a second illustration and then playing with the color on that, just so that you leave those ones with those wonderful kind of lost and found edges. Um, I really, really like those lost and found edges that are going on there. And I'd be, be sad if those got kind of so you can do several things. One is that you can, the idea is you just want to think of dark against light and light against dark. Right. So if um, the polar bear is backlit, the snow behind it is brighter, and then you've got all those crazy blue shadows and things, and the kind of the yellows and the fur kind of coming out in your bear. And maybe along the edges of the bear, you've got where the sunlight is coming through that, these bright, you know, highlights. If um, <clears throat> the, uh, if the light is directly on the bear, and so the light is behind you, then um, you can have bright bear put, but you put in some dark background, and that dark background then makes the the, the bear stand out. Um, but then you, I would just sort of play with the idea that a big part of being a polar bear is not showing your contour. That's like, that's it's 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 mo. It's game. My favorite, um, uh, Robert Bateman made this wonderful painting of a polar bear, <laughs> and you look at it, and it's like this big kind of dark painting, and then you realize that you're like this with a polar bear that is kind of appearing out of a snowstorm, and you're like, whoa, <laughs> there's the polar bear, but it's totally hidden. Um, in it, so it's 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 part of that environment. Uh, oh, they're really ghost in the storms, so a snowstorm, like you don't see them. That's that's for sure. Yes, and hiding yeah, this. I would I would I would play with that kind of ghost idea, and when, then with the, with the the way we talk about that in, in in art terms is it's lost and found edges. And so I'll, I'll show you just a couple of. Um, let me grab a sketch pad. Just a couple of thoughts to play with that. Um, so if if I have my 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 polar bear and my my polar bear is you know some somewhere in in here. And if, if I just kind of come along and I say, you know, here is the edge of my polar bear, right? I've just done a very non-polar bear thing. <laughs> it's like, wow, there's a very bold edge between polar bear and the environment. And the whole idea of being a polar bear is that the, its contour is a semi-permeable membrane, right? That some places you're seeing that edge of the bear and other places you're you're not. Um, so um, the things to, to, to play with is, is if I do have part of a back contour, let's say there's a little bump on the shoulder here and then a polar bear butt coming up. 
Um, there can be some places where I'm kind of drawing that in, but there can be other places as you did very effectively where you're just sort of letting that line, if I've got a line that kind of comes this way and then that picks up here, people's brains will fill in that gap. So, but I'm intentionally minding the gap. I'm going to leave places where um, that edge is, is lost. And other things I can do is, um, let's say this is a, a backlit bear. Um, I'm going to just sort of draw in some values in this area here. Um, so the part of the bear that is kind of um, in shadow, you can actually get beautiful rich shadows. And then if the background is dark, then that also sort of shows your edge by, 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 by contrast. Um, similarly, um, the so if I that I can have um, I can have you know place where you've got dark bear against light. So um, what your 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 formula then is um, dark against light and light against dark. So. Um, if there's a variable background that is dark in some places and light in other places, you can play with on your bare surface um, what places your bare is dark and what places your bare is light. And kind of that form will, um, you're sort of playing with this sort of the, the idea of the subject ground paper for you. thing. So some places I have. Um, some places I'm, I'm kind of drawing the shape of the air next to the bear. Some places I'm drawing the bear, and um, very much like those 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 wonderful illusions where you know if you're looking at it, it's a young woman um, or it's the face of an older woman. Um, you know, you want with your polar bear. Sometimes you're looking at it and it looks like it's a pile of black spots, and sometimes you look at your polar bear and you go like, oh, it's a Dalmatian. Um, the, uh, uh, check out the Dal, uh, Dalmatian illusion. Um, and uh, let me see if I can actually. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. Um, I am going to uh, share something with all you folks. Um, this is a, um, one moment, there's Zoom, I want to share. So here is a bunch of random dots. And when you look at it as a bunch of random dots, you see a bunch of random dots. Um, when somebody says it's a Dalmatian, once you see the Dalmatian, you can't not see the Dalmatian. Um, but um, until that point, it's a, it's a random collection of of spots and, and blotches instead of a Dalmatian going exploring in the park. Um, and I think that there's sort of that your brain kind of dances between subject and, 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 and ground. And that is, uh, I, you know, the polar bear can also have a lot of this sort of same, the same energy and action. Was that of, 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 of use, Nicholas? Do, was I? Yes, that was awesome. Uh, and I think uh, lost edges is a perfect word to, to think about it. And, and even like, I think uh, it, I can draw in my mind something with just these two words. Excellent, excellent. Um, that's, 
I, I, I love seeing what you do with that. Hey, and the next time you're out uh, serving uh, polar bears, if it's COVID free time, give me a call. Um, I want to come play. Yeah, you are highly invited. Oh, uh, that would be, that would be uh, just wonderful. Uh, are you still doing that research? For now, we uh, we do less polar bear research, but we do a lot of uh, bird migration uh, studies. Uh, all the birds uh, nesting in the Arctic, especially shorebirds and uh, the predators of the shorebirds, uh, such as peregrines, geopelicans, and uh, uh, different species of Jaegers. And then we try to to see uh, the impact of climate change on, on them. And um, if um, uh, we want to also to see when you have like a uh, more impact of uh, human uh, use of the, the land, uh, like more shit coming into uh, the uh, ice bridges and how that affect uh, the concentration of uh, seals and how the polar bears are moving inland more and more and then how they can eat more of the terrestrial birds. And then the, the same also uh, uh, impact on, on the Arctic foxes, the main predators for now for all these uh, migratory birds that are declining very, very fast. Uh, we lost, like in the last 30 years, almost 33% uh, uh, of uh, most Arctic breeding shorebirds. Uh, so it's it's quite dramatic. Say, say that again. Uh, so we, in the last 30 years, we lost almost 30% of uh, the the breeding uh, numbers in the Arctic uh, breeding shorebirds. So you know, this is this is in our lifetime. This is on our watch. And these are things that as stewards of nature, um, without the data and the evidence that you collect, we're not, um, we, we can't make real evidence-based decisions without that kind of data. So thank you for being out there on the ground and feeding those mosquitoes. Thank um, you. The, um, but, but also then the, 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 the flip side of this is that we as citizens, um, this is the, the more that we can expand the our, 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 our bubble of responsibility, right? Um, to include um, people often start with themselves and then they might go to their immediate family and then we can pass that out to the community and then it's a leap then to extend that out into um, the the birds of the uh, that are, are are nesting on the Arctic shelf there. They can't vote. They can't make decisions that affect climate, and we can. And, and so yeah, all that yeah, all that work is done with the communities, uh, the Inuit communities in the north, and then uh, we try to have most of our research done uh, not only with them, but also following their advice, what they see on the land, living there. All the time, and then, and then that's uh, that's very uh, very uh, important to do. But it's it's a work uh, that we have to do every year. And now with the COVID, that we were not able to do much of that at all. Uh, less transport to to the Arctic, but we hope to go back there soon. So, um, on behalf of this community, thank you for your work in stewardship. Thank you. And science. Um, so yeah, respect. Um, let's see, I think I said, we're gonna jump over to Ray Bonto. Um, and I am not, oh, there you are, hi there. Um, add spotlight, welcome. Hi. Uh. <clears throat> So, I decided to just um, go in with some colored pencils, make a few circles. Nice. Um, uh, more circles, not the uh, four. Um, yeah, this is this is that geometry which we want to. Kind of track down, and I see you've got those leaf shapes um, showing the, uh, the, the different angles. Um, and it's so counterintuitive, so incredibly counterintuitive. That's really cool. 
Um, and also just visually, um, I love the way that you um, you just you you've got you play with different um, colors and stuff. Just everybody notice how this just makes you want to. It makes you want to experiment like this. It makes the whole process so much more fun and so much more playful. These little studies, you just throw some color in, onto it like this, and it's going to be, it's just a ton of fun. Yeah. This is, uh, this is great. So yeah, we're going to build on this geometric framework. And um, and then uh, learn how to put all sorts of crazy nuance and subtlety into um, those 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 shapes which we make with their, their their the geometry and the angles that are behind them. Thank you. Thank you, Arpan. It's good to see you too. Hi, Jack. Good to see you. All right. Thank you both. Um, now let's see. Next, we were going over to. Um, let's see. Ah, uh, I got ahead of myself and I forgot who I'd said next. Um, I think it was Annette and then LK. Was that it? I think so. All right. So we're going to jump over to Annette and where? Oh, there you are. Um, so. So, I just. Uh, tried to follow what you did and made myself uh, uh, some diagrams to remember <laughs> all your advice. Um, so I, I really um, I was aware of foreshortening, but I, I'm going to be looking a lot more closely now uh, as to what happens at the 45 degree angle and, and when things turn. So thank you very, very much. I have a couple uh, flower paintings that I did last summer from flowers in my garden. But oh, talk about lost and found edges and sort of playing with negative shapes in here. Hold this a little bit closer to the screen. Oh, how lively. So that was um, just, you know, sketching and looking at what I was seeing. And um, I was a little more aware of it with this one. Um, you know, as far as the symmetry and the foreshortening, but again, I was just, I was drawing by what I was seeing rather than and negative shapes, rather than thinking about what was happening with the geometry of it all. So now I'm, my brain is really on fire with thinking isn't, about- Isn't that fun? Isn't it fun? Because you can, yeah. you, you can take that geometry and splice it in with that, that deep looking that you're doing and and things open up. Yeah. And, so, and it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't make it all rigid. It just gives you this other level of of seeing that can happen. Could we see that first botanical study? All right. So on, on this, I want to encourage people to notice those that that so the daisy, yellow daisy in the uh, center right, um, notice how it pops out and You've got you've got a feeling of depth and dimension in this. What is it that Annette is doing that is making that pop like that? And I want you to notice as you look at it how it's not an accident that there are dark values right around that flower. And notice also how when you go out on the tips of some of those petals right out there, you also have some lighter values right on the tips of those petals. Light against dark and dark against light. And the places where those contrasts play the most, that's right where your eye goes right into that spot. And so that's, uh, those, those are really effective strategies for um, playing with it. So she doesn't have to kind of get out there with a pencil and kind of say, here's the edge of this, here's the edge of this, here's the edge of this. She's letting the values do that. And she's also, by that change in the values, um, punched in a bunch more depth into that painting. I also, something that I really like about this is the way that there are parts of it that are soft and are fading into sort of the mist of the background. And then there are other places where she's crisply getting in there and you see the edges of the harebells and the daisies. 
And um, having, if everything was tightly done, then the painting would not have as much sort of movement and, um, and, and kind of life to it. So just as we saw with the polar bear, there are some of these have kind of lost and found edges. And there are places, think about kind of the role of the viewer's share in looking at artwork. So there's part that the um, artist does for you. And then there's part that you have to do yourself. And one reason why this is so effective is because she's making you work a little bit. And it's fun to work like that. And it gets your brain kind of in there and playing with that. Um, Annette, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you very much. Bye, John. I, I'm now going to jump over to LK. Um, if you are there, we would. Hi there. Oh, you're currently muted. Oh, yeah. Um, so I just got my nature journal and uh, today I was drawing, um, my mom's getting these plants because we're growing plants. Um, so we've been growing plants in our house and this is lentils. Oh, um, I've been drawing the quinoa. <laughs> oh, this is great. So you've got all your starts and you're um, got those inside and you're, you're, you're drawing those. I, I've also got, um, uh, 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 tell us a little bit more what you've got. I, I think your mantle um, and your, your kind of kitchen window may look very similar to mine. <laughs> these projects going on. What else are you working on? Um, also, like almost every week, we've been buying flowers and from the florist. I don't know if you can see, but there's some flowers in the back. And like the way front with the big window. Um, I don't know. It's kind of blurry, but. Um, could we take a look at some of the journal pages that you've been working on, OK? Yeah, um, so I've been drawing the tulip that we have. Oh, and with these nice views you've got in the side and then looking down the throat of it and very kind of Evea style showing the different structures that are in there. Um, Evea, I'd love to pull you in on this conversation too. Oh. Absolutely, I and love it. And is that, oh, look at the detail. Look, Avea, check out that detail of the pistol. Zooming in on that pistol tip. Yes, I see it. That's so cool. Like you can just, you get the sense that it will definitely like catch all of those little grains of pollen all over it. I love it. It almost feels sticky to me. Yes. <laughs> and also there was this day that I was drawing dark-eyed juncos, like whenever one popped up, I would just draw like some dark-eyed junco and like whatever they were doing. And my entire page was filled with dark-eyed juncos. This, this activity, that, yeah, hold that, get that a little bit closer to the screen. This is something I'm gonna suggest to, for everyone on this call. Take your local bird and love it. Get to know whatever is common around you so intimately. So because LK here has made all of these drawings of juncos, the proportions and postures of juncos are now going to be ingrained into her head. Really? The result of this is a different species of bird is now going to pop up in front of her and she'll look at it and go like, oh, wow, that's got a really long neck or a really long tail. That's got it. She'll be able to make some notes about proportions or the angle that it holds its body. And it will stand out to her because she has now in her head a benchmark, a ruler by which she can measure every other species because she knows the dark eyed junco so well. What some people do is they draw one junco and go like, okay, I got juncos. And, um, but no, 
Look at how different all these are. And with each one, she's learning more and more and more and more about Junko-ness. And that informs then every other bird that she looks at. Uh, when you first start looking at birds, people say like, you know, does this have a big head or a small head? And you'll say, it's got a medium head. Is this a long tail or a short tail? It's a medium tail. Everything will be medium. And the reason is because you don't have a ruler. You don't have a unit of measurement by which you can compare all the other species. But once you spend your time digging in with the junco, that becomes the metric by which you measure all the rest of the species. This is so cool, LK. Awesome, awesome journaling. So also um, this drawing of a woodpecker feather, I did. Um, because we have like so many things because like I'm not going to find many woodpecker feathers right now but I did well other feathers but I don't think I'll find one that's pretty big that I wanted to draw so I found one because we have like so many stuff that we collect oh good and I found one on our, our bookshelf and I drew it we also have like so many other things like turtle shells Oh, I'm just delighted that you uh, are collecting those things as you've been out and adventuring around. And in the middle of winter, those are such a gift. And uh, sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll see something during the summer, you pick it up and you put it on the shelf. And then in the cold of winter, when everything is covered in snow, out comes that snake, that turtle shell or the snail shell. And um, it's a chance to, um, just, you know, see and discover. Oh, wonderful. And also, um, I dissected a tomato. Ah. Okay, Avea's leaning in. <laughs> oh, yes. And labeled it, these labeled drawings. I also like how you're using labels and arrows just to sort of show relationships between things and parts of things. You're, you're really thinking like a scientist. And I see that and you know the size too. The, the what? The size, I see, I see, I can't quite read, um, but it says, I think it says equal size. So so you were noting that, it, that that's accurate size. That's really awesome, the good notes, really, really clear notes. And those are the kind of things you want to, you want to remember too. Um, not only because then it reminds you of that day that you were studying it, but then you remember for next time, this really worked in, in helping me remember. So those are all like, keys that you remember when you're doing future studies and i also had a question because like i wrote it down here and i said why are most fruits round and i listed like a bunch of fruits that are round oh that is a really cool question um you know, what i like to do with a question like that is i will often try to come up with um, as many possible answers as I can. Um, sometimes when you go and you look something up, um, what people will do is they will, what a lot of people do is they will kind of go for the sort of the first kind of plausible answer that they hear. Um, but as, as scientists, we like to kind of, we like to think of like, why could that be? And what are some possible reasons why that could be? And sometimes um, phenomena that you're looking at have sort of multiple forces and causes working on them. Um, and there's also interesting ways to think about that. There's thinking about kind of developmentally, why did it kind of sort of development sort of, uh, why, why sort of in the, the, the short term, you know, from the seed, why is it then coming out as this round thing? And you can also think, um, evolutionarily as well. So over time, what has kind of brought these things to kind of a convergence on, on these round shapes? That's really cool. Great question. Great question. You're so, thinking, um, LK, I really see you thinking like a journaler, thinking like a scientist. Um, the way you're diagramming, the way you're asking questions. Um, so um, uh, Nicholas, as, as a scientist and somebody who's sort of spent uh, time in sciences, um, what, what are your thoughts about kind of what you're seeing on these journal pages? I just love it uh, for the, um, the intricacy of the details 
Like uh, we love details as scientists. We, we want to know as much as possible. Samples is, is really like a key word as well. We need to have as many samples. And I see the, the exercise of drawing different birds or different uh, angles of uh, like it's a tomato like you sh saw us. And uh, that's something that helps a lot convey the general pattern and, and everything gets better uh, shaped uh, in our mind. And if we do analysis, that's exactly what we want. We want samples and, and have a general overview of what's going on. And so that's, I see it as a, as, as a nice way to even teach uh, statistics to, to young uh, people as well for uh, understanding what's coming for our birds or for our mammals around us. Ah, oh, that's, that's really exciting. Um, and yes. Um, also, I I I saw something really strange. I'm not sure what it was. So I saw this junko pick up this thing on the ground, and it had like this circle at the end. And like, I drew it. It looked black to me at the moment, but I'm not really sure if that's the exact colors. And I drew this here. Can you get a little bit closer to the screen? Oh, and I'm seeing again. This is uh, Nicholas. This is a great another example of kind of scientific thinking. So she's saying like this looks black, and then she's got a little question mark by it. So on observations that she's not as solid on, she's also putting in kind of an indication of the. Um, sort of her level of confidence in that observation. Um, so this is, that's some very cool scientific thinking. I wonder what that's, I, we, we keep looking. Um, I wonder if you'll be able to find other things that that do like, somebody will be out there like, oh, I wonder if this is, that was the little thing that my Junko picked up. Because you've got these notes, we'll be able to go back and compare it. If that happens, you tell us, okay? Yeah, and also I thought it might have been food, but like it's not because juncos always eat their food underneath the feeder and don't like fly away like chickadees and eat them like somewhere else on a branch. Mm -hmm. So I saw that it couldn't be food, so maybe it was nesting material because like spring is really soon, but I'm not sure. So this one picked it up and then flew off with it. Yeah. You're right. So, so um, LK, your, your observations about chickadees and junco feeding behavior, very, very good. Those are right sort of uh, nut hatches, chickadees, they'll come into the feeder, grab a seed, they'll go off, they'll cache it. Um, things like a junco will just sit there and they will fill their tummy up to the brim. Um, so you've been doing some very good observation of um, ethology, of behavior, and uh, I love to see that. Thank you so much for sharing those, um, those, uh, those, those entries with us, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what is, what's happening in your journal soon. Let's jump over to Rachel, who has been very patient here. Rachel, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. And um, we're very interested to see what you've got going on in your journal. So I drew a cypress tree. Uh, we were at Samuel Farm sitting by the pond. And we saw the cypress tree with no leaves on it. Mm. So did- We did, liked to nature junior Journal it. Here's the picture I took. All right. So I like the way you're um, adding kind of collage into your journal. So you can have photographs, you can have your drawings. So you're using found objects, or, or sorry, I mean, uh, the photographs you're taking. You're also drawing in your own drawings, as well as using written notes to describe what you see. And as nature journalers, we get all of those tools together. And that allows us to just to make so much more out of every observation. What for you was the most interesting thing about this cypress tree? It was how it was kind of like had knees. So I found one that
that kind of look like a leg with the knee. So that's my up close. Are you in the um, southeast, southeastern United States? I'm in the north United States. Uh, what, what state would that be? Texas. You're in Texas. Cool. So we've got... <clears throat> Um, you have the sorts of, so those, those cypress trees with those strange knee formations. Um, unfortunately, we don't have those out here in California. Um, our cypress trees are going in dry places and they don't have those crazy knees. Um, can you hold it up so that we can see some of the knee structures that you've, you've got? Um, that's such an interesting form on those trees. I'm less experienced because I'm only six. Oh, well, but, but you're also a, an accurate observer and you are curious. And the more you do this, the skills are just going to keep coming and coming and coming and coming. And because you're starting when you are six, um, because you're, you're starting now, you're going to find that your abilities and your skills are just going to grow and grow and grow. What do we have here? It's an earthworm we kind of kept as a pet, but I can't, I can't remember when we got these earthworms. It was probably in the summer. Mm -hmm. we, we found them in the dirt. Yeah, the, um, and I like the color variation. So I see the reds and uh, the browns of the earthworm, uh, uh, the reds and the brown colors in there that really remind me of those, uh, the colors that you see in earthworms. Um, again, you're using pictures and you're using, integrating them with words. And my up close. And zoom in, zoom out. So those are the, that's, sure. you've got the naturalist toolkit going. So you've got words and pictures going on here. Um, zooming in on parts of things, zooming out on your cypress tree, adding in photographs. Oh, tell us more about this experience. So we were at Samro Farms again. That yeah, sounds like a fun place. In the meadow, meadow, and our grandma told us that because we're homeschooled, we're teach by our grandma. And she said while we were at Samuel Farms to play a guessing game. And you should pick a, something to nature journal to, um, so my brothers Luke and Jude could guess it. And they guessed the right thing. And it says, I noticed, wait, what? I noticed that it, has berries at attached to it. I wonder what eats the berries. I wonder what seed the tree grew. Yeah, Those, we, we, we use the same prompts. We, I'm, I'm also doing I notice and I wonder and sometimes I do it reminds me of. And I think I know that that game where you get to choose a plant and then you record your observations about it and then you let your then you let uh, Luke and Jude or other people in your family try to find the one that you did. And because you've got those written notes and the careful observations you've recorded in your drawing, um, other people are able to pick out that explicit that exact one. Oh, you might not see this but because it's really light but it says it the whole tree is actually 15 15 feet tall oh, i see now now you've taken it to the next level rachel rachel you've got words pictures and numbers we use all of those together and we have these three very very different and really useful languages for documenting all of our discoveries and experiences i'm really proud of you rachel um this is uh, this is a, exactly how we should be nature journaling. Oh. I'm always just playing with what I 
have been going in my mind. I tried to make a sunset. I like those sort of colors and blending into each other and playing with our, just being willing to play on the pages of our journal. Great way to learn how all your materials work and just to have fun. We gotta keep this fun. I wanna keep this fun for everybody. Rachel, thank you so much. Okay, so it's gonna slip. Okay, here's my map. It's um going from our grandma's house, which is home right here all the way to, this was at December. This was actually at December mm -hmm. last year. Um, so our home is right here. And then next is the, the boat house that my grandma has next door house. Making little maps like this is a, a, also a very good journaling activity. Uh, so anybody who's watching this, I want to encourage you to consider including maps in your journal, little hand-drawn maps. Oh, this is, this is, that's a really, this is really high level mapping. Um, yeah, you don't, you can come up with a symbol for the different sorts of things that you find. Rachel, this is exciting journaling. Do you enjoy nature journaling? Yes, I do. I do very much because I get to spend time with Luke and Jude and my grandma doing stuff in the nature journal. Those, those are such special family times together. And uh, the key says that stuff are snowflakes, many Santas, snow dogs, Christmas reef, the Pampas grass. The, the Pampas grass? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we have that like right in there. Would you do a favor for me? Um, would you please uh, tell your grandmother the next time you see her that I am- I'm here right now. Oh, she, grandma's here right now? Grandma? Okay. We're gonna just say hi to uh, Rachel's grandma in just a moment. Um, so if you have, if you're able to mentor somebody else in their nature journaling, it changes, it can change somebody's world. It can change the way that they see, change the way that they, they, they think. And um, you can see the, 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 the power of, of these experiences um, because you're, you're, you're paying attention to the world. Hi, Mr. Laws. Hey there, I, we just wanted to say how delighted we are with um, what you have encouraged in Rachel here. Her nature journaling is uh, Thank you. just so curious and observant and uh, joyful. Um, so you've Thank brought you. um, fun to this. You have, um, you're obviously role modeling it yourself. This is something I'm guessing you guys do together. Yes, and it is. And this is, um, I, 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 I just want to say, uh, you rock. And uh, you are an inspiration to a lot of other people in our, on, our, on the call here, um, just sort of seeing the seeds that you have planted in Rachel. Thank you. We, we do it as a family. We all go out with our journals and, and do our thing. And then we've been watching also your short videos for kids as well. And they're very inspired to draw and to observe things and to find stuff. That's fun. So thank you for your, your teaching. We really appreciate it. We, we record this, so thank you. <laughs> Great, thank well, you. it's a pleasure to meet you.
Bye bye. Bye bye. Awesome. Bye. Bye bye, Rachel. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. You're welcome. No, I do it too. Yeah. Um, let's take a look. Um, is there anybody else that wanted to share um, something that they have been working on? Um, it. I don't see um, anybody holding something up to their screen at this moment. Um, so in, a, in just a second, I'll turn off the recording. Um, but before I do, I just want to thank all of you um, for your participation in this community and uh, want to just encourage you to find, um, to, you know, if you've gotten off of like the habit and routine of nature journaling, don't beat yourself up. Just, just give yourself permission just to start again and just to start again and to have fun with that. Um, and um, to be safe, be kind, and um, this community is here for you. And thank you all. <laughs>